Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are delighted to be hosting this briefing on offshore wind this afternoon with Senator Carper's office. And of course, we are even more delighted that Senator Carper is here with us this afternoon to kick off this important briefing. Offshore wind is something that hasn't received a lot of attention here in the US, which is a shame because it's received a lot of attention in other parts of the world. So this is an opportunity for us to play a little bit of catch up to find out what's really going on uh, in different countries around the world because it truly is a proved, proven technology, uh, it has been providing commercial uh, power generation uh, very, very successfully for a number of years now. You will hear a lot more about that. And we are very excited to talk about what really is also happening here in the U.S. where uh, we think that it will have a very bright future. But in order for that to happen, there are a lot of things that have to come together in terms of thinking about how technology needs, financial needs, policy needs, how they all come together because certainly the potential resource in this country in terms of looking at our coastal resources as well as the offshore wind resources in the Great Lakes are absolutely immense. But first, let me just mention a couple things about Senator Carper from Delaware that I think are very important for us as we move forward this afternoon. First of all, he is, serves on a number of committees here in the Senate where he is ranking member of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. He serves on the Science Committee, or, or, I'm sorry, on the Finance Committee and also on the Environment and Public Works Committee. And one of the things that he has been known for since he's been here in the Senate since 2001 is his ability to really work across party lines. And in fact, he has sponsored so much legislation, has done a lot of work on many issues, particularly in the whole environment and clean energy areas, in which he really has demonstrated his ability to really be a problem solver and somebody who really tries to build consensus. Now, I would submit to you that that comes from so much of his prior experience, which he has, he brings a wealth of experience coming from state and local government in which he, uh, prior to coming to the Senate, he had been governor, he had been the state treasurer, he had also served five terms as Delaware's congressman uh, in the House of Representatives. And coupled with that, he also brought with him, um, the, at the very, very start of his career, his experience uh, in the Navy as a Naval Flight Officer uh, for five years and where he served three tours of duty in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War and then continued to serve in the Naval Reserve, retiring as a mission command, er, in, retiring at the rank of captain in 1991. So when you start to weave together all of his public service coming from that in uniform and leading there as well as having to lead through all of these offices state government, and also here in the Congress. We are very, very glad that we have Senator Carper also leading on this issue. Senator Carper. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Carol. Welcome to the uh, committee hearing room on Environment and Public Works Committee. Um, and uh, let me just say to, to our panelists, uh, from left to right, right to left, it's nice to see all you guys and gal, and uh, we're, um, Honored that you're here. Thanks for joining us. And frank, frankly, thank you for showing the way in, uh, with respect to, uh, to uh, renewables and, uh, and offshore wind in some cases. Uh, I want to thank uh, Laura Haynes Gillum. Laura, would you raise, raise your hand? Laura, ha Laura Haynes and her security uh, detail, uh, uh, Jill, here to keep, uh, make sure she's protected. She's with child. And uh, so we're taking real good care of Laura. And uh, we're happy you're here. We're happy that you're here. I just want to follow up on couple things that Carol said. Uh, I spent uh, five years of my life in a hot war in Southeast Asia. Our job uh, there was to uh, uh, fly low-level missions about 500 feet off the water in uh, uh, big airplanes, 30-man crews called Navy P-3 aircraft. And our job was to intercept and infiltrate a trawlers come, trying to come in to uh, resupply the Viet Cong. Uh, we were uh, trying to maintain the 
prop up the government of South Vietnam. The Viet, uh, North Vietnamese were trying to bring them down, and they were using the Viet Cong to do that. And our job was to uh, find these little junk fishing boats in the South China Sea, not too far from Spratly Island, a place where the Chinese are building uh, run uh, runways and stuff like that. And uh, our mission was to uh, find them, track them in to the uh, coast, and turn them over to swift boats. John Kerry, thank you. And to uh, the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, to board them and see what was going, uh, going on. Uh, I learned a lot about, uh, about leadership uh, from the age of 17. I was Navy WOTC midshipman and served until right to the end of the Cold War, uh, August of 1991. And when I stepped down the next month, I led a congressional delegation of uh, Vietnam veterans in the House to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos to try to find out what happened to 3,000 MIAs. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so that's a little bit about my past. I learned a lot about leadership over that time. And among the things I learned are these things. And this is, and it relates to what we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. Leadership. Our leaders are humble, not haughty. Uh, we lead by our example. It's not do as I say, it's do as I do. Leaders should be servants. Our job is to serve, not be served. Leaders should stay out of step, have the courage to stay out of step when everybody else is marching to the wrong tune. Leaders should be aspirational, appeal to people's better angels. Our leaders don't build themselves up by running other people down. Our leaders are interested in uh, doing what's right, not what's easy or expedient, but what is right. Our leaders treat other people the way we want to be treated. That was the lesson we heard from the Pope. Do we have any Catholics here? Okay. I said to, I'm Presbyterian. I said to some of my Catholic friends in the Senate last week, the Pope would make a great Presbyterian. <laughs> and I think he would. He's not a bad Catholic either. But uh, one of the things he tried to drill home with us in our joint session and everywhere else he went, golden rule, treat other people the way you want to be treated, most important rule of all. Uh, another leadership lesson for, uh, for me was um, to uh, focus on excellence in everything we do. If it isn't perfect, make it better. And the last one would be, when you know you're right, you're sure you're right, don't give up. Don't give up. And those are sort of like my, uh, my uh, training as a leader uh, coming up. And I used all these in the Navy for all those years. I've used those lessons uh, as the treasurer and governor of my state and in the Congress uh, and the House and the Senate. And uh, I'm too old to change. So how does all that relate to uh, offshore wind? Uh, find out what works and do more of that. Well, thank you. Thank you for showing us what works and seeing if, uh, if we could do some of that as well. Find out what is uh, right, uh, not necessarily easy or expedient, but what is the right thing to do. Well, finding new ways to generate uh, energy in ways that are uh, not harmful to our environment that actually put a lot of people to work. Maybe that's not such a bad idea. If it isn't perfect, make it better. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, my, my son Christopher, MIT graduate, mechanical engineer, uh, when he was in, uh, in college, spent a summer in Erie, Pennsylvania. How many been to Erie, Pennsylvania? It was a big, uh, big uh, operation there by GE, and uh, he worked on uh, wind turbine gear reduction boxes for the better part of the summer. There's a lot of jobs that can flow, a lot of uh, research and development that flow from wind, and frankly, we're doing a lot better in terms of our ability to generate uh, electricity now than we were that summer that he worked there, gosh, almost 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. Um, and the other one is like, when you know you're right, you're sure you're right, just don't give up. Just don't give up. And um, I, uh, how many have ever been to Delaware? Raise your hand. Not just, not just came through on I-95, paid the toll, <laughs> not just used your easy pass, or, or, no, no, you actually got out of your car, maybe went to the south and, southern part of our state. Has anybody ever been to any of our beaches? Any, any beaches? We have more five, I think Delaware, last time I checked, has more five-star beaches than any state in America. Little Delaware, can you believe that? And uh, the, uh, one of them is called Rehoboth. Rehoboth. Does anybody know what Rehoboth is in the Bible? Anybody know what Rehoboth means when you translate it uh, to English? Uh, anybody know? Here's what it means. It means room for all. Is that nice? Including you <laughs> and your family and your friends. Room for all. Um, if you stand on Rehoboth Beach and look east, uh, you look at the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, if you look kind of east-northeast, you're looking toward uh, New Jersey. But if you look east, you're looking at the Atlantic Ocean. And if you happen to travel hmm, maybe 12, 13, 14 miles due east from Rehoboth Beach, you find a place 
for the wind is just right. Just right. Anybody here remember the, uh, uh, the fable about the fairy tale about Goldilocks? Uh, you know, the, the, the story about the porridge that was too hot, the porridge that was too cold, and the porridge was just right. It was a place uh, just uh, due east of uh, Rahola, uh, almost 15 miles out there, where the wind is just right. Not too hard, not too soft, just right. And about seven uh, years ago, I was at the University of Delaware's College of Marine Studies in Lewis, Delaware, not Lewis, Delaware, Lewis, Delaware. It's about uh, six, seven miles north of Rahola. And uh, I met with the folks at the, it was in the College of Marine Studies, the College of Marine Studies. And it's now, it's no longer called the College of Marine Studies. I, I don't remember what it's called now. So you know what I call them? The College of Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's what I call them. But what is now the College of Earth, Wind, and Fire uh, shared with me all these uh, maps uh, off of the, uh, the, uh, the Atlantic coast of the U.S. From right on their shores, going out 5, 10, 15, 20, 20, 50 miles, 60, 100 miles. And uh, it was uh, basically sharing the, where the wind blew, you know, what direction it blew, the different speeds that it, uh, that it blew. And what they said to me, uh, they said, uh, Senator Carper, Rehoboth Beach, 12, 13 miles out, that's a great place to create wind. And, uh, and they said, we put a lot of people to work, uh, deploying uh, windmill farms. We would harness the wind. We put a lot of people to work maintaining uh, those uh, windmill farms. And we would, uh, because the wind is always blowing out there, it's not too hard, not too soft, just right. Uh, we would have a reliable uh, form of, or source of energy for many, many years to come. And uh, the woman who was the head of the, uh, the College of Earth, Wind and Fire at the time, Nancy Target, I said, Nancy, you had me from hello. And she did. She did. Uh, among the reasons why uh, Susan Collins, before that Olympia Snow, and I have been uh, pushing the idea of an investment tax credit, an investment tax credit that uh, would basically provide not a, a tax uh, revenue, a tax uh, uh, stream, revenue stream after a, uh, a windmill was, uh, was put into use, but it would provide it at the commencement of construction. And a production tax credit works just fine for on land, because it's not so expensive to, to build them on land. You know that, and I know that. It's a lot harder and a lot more expensive to put them 12, 15, 30, 40, 50 miles out to sea. It's a lot of money. And uh, we figured out, if we're going to try to see if this works here, what we should do is say, we want to not provide a tax credit forever for offshore wind, but we want to get it started. We want to get it started. And the way our legislation that we introduced in the last Congress or two with Olympia Snow and most, re most recently with uh, Susan is that the uh, current version of the bill, current version of the bill that we introduced in the last Congress, it said, basically said this. Any, uh, any uh, construction begun, I want to say, was it begin at the end of last year? Last year? Huh? Huh? All right, but it began before the end of last year, before December, by December 31st, 2014. If it, the construction began by that date, that construction project would uh, uh, realize a 30% tax, investment tax credit, okay? If they started the day after, too bad, too bad. But it, the idea was to get them started. Uh, nobody took advantage of that tax credit, did they? Well, maybe one, maybe one. Folks from, a, <laughs> folks from a, a smaller state, but not much smaller, uh, took advantage of it. And uh, that uh, tax credit has expired, and uh, what we have to do is to extend it. And the idea is to extend it, not by a couple months, but actually by a couple years. So that any uh, uh, investments, any construction, offshore wind that begins by the end of next year, by December 31st, uh, 2016, would realize the tax credit. Uh, let's say we have uh, 6,000 uh, uh, megawatts of generating capacity signs up by the end of next year. Well, only the first 3,000 would uh, benefit from the, uh, the tax credit. We want to get it started. We want to find out and test and see if this, uh, if this works. That's the way it works, 3,000 megawatts. First 3,000 signs up, you make the cut, you're good to go. If you don't, too bad. 
but uh, the others will have uh, a, good, uh, a good tool to use. So that's what we're trying to do. The legislation will be offered again as part of, obviously as part of some tax extenders, a bunch of tax extenders before the tax, uh, before the finance committee. And uh, later this year, if we make, we've made sure that we don't close, shut down the government this year, this month, this week, get through that. And we'll have the opportunity to fight our cyber wars and do some other things uh, that we, uh, we need to, uh, to get done. And we'll do that uh, during the course of the fall. And hopefully before the end of this, uh, before Christmas, before Christmas Eve, before December 20th, uh, we will have passed uh, most of the stuff that we need to pass and also put in place some tax extenders that will include the provision offered previously by Olympia Snow, now by Susan Collins and myself that I've just explained to all of you. Without it, I don't think we're going to see any, uh, uh, any offshore wind uh, construction uh, begin or be completed. Uh, with it, I think we will. I think we will. And, uh, and we'll see how it works, and we'll learn from that uh, going forward. Let me stop, uh, let me stop there. And uh, anybody has a comment? Anybody has a question? If anybody wants to ask me where is the newest national park in America, I will answer that question, Delaware. <laughs> anybody else? Any comments? No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, anything I missed? Come on. Oh, she thinks we're all good. Okay, folks. Everybody still awake? <laughs> all right. Let me say to the uh, the panel, I am your opening act. I'm your opening act, and they are all yours. Long story short, uh, many roles of government. Uh, Lincoln said it best: uh, the role of government is to do for the people what they cannot do for themselves. In this case. We can't build offshore wind uh, in this country without uh, a tax policy that actually helps to enable it. And I think Susan Collins, before that, uh, Olympia Snow and I have pretty good enabling legislation. And if we do it, I think, or at least give it a try, I think at the end of the day we'll say, as smart as those Brits were, as smart as those Germans were, and the, D the Danes, uh, we're not stupid because we learned from what they did. And we took a, a good idea and maybe, hopefully, made it even better. Thank you very much. God bless. Remember, what does Rehoboth mean? What does Rehoboth mean? Room for including you. Come and see us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Carper. So hopefully we will see some things happen on the policy side before the end of the year, as Senator Carper was suggesting. Uh, that will help benefit um, uh, some of the things, what we're, what we're talking about today. Um, Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island is someone else here in the Senate who cares very much about offshore wind, and particularly because uh, his state is home to that first project that we're going to be hearing about in a little bit. Uh, the whole delegation has been extremely, extremely supportive of what's going on at Block Island. Uh, but Senator Reid uh, uh, has been very involved in this issue, and he is also the co-chair of the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus as well, uh, as well as serving on the Appropriations Committee here in the Senate, and he is also on Armed Services Committee and also on the Banking Committee. And so in that capacity, he has also looked at many uh, energy and environmental issues. And again, as with Senator Carper, uh, Senator Jack Reed also brings a commitment of longtime service. Uh, he had graduated from West Point and then served uh, as uh, with the 82nd Airborne Division as a platoon leader and company commander and battalion staff officer. So it's another aspect of, of one of the many ways in which he has also served as a leader both in uniform and then in other public service through serving three terms in the Rhode Island State Senate, uh, as well as three terms here in the House of Representatives before being elected to the Senate. And so we do, he was not able to join us this afternoon, but we do have a video from him. Hello, everyone. 
I want to extend my warmest greetings as you gather this afternoon and thank you for your efforts to promote clean and renewable energy. I would also like to thank the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for organizing this briefing, as well as Deepwater Wind CEO Jeff Grabowski for his leadership and participation. Jeff can give you a first-hand update on the progress we are making in my home state of Rhode Island with the Block Island Wind Farm becoming the first offshore wind farm in construction in the United States. The steel is in the water, it's impressive, and they've already installed four of the five foundations for this project. When it's completed, it should lower energy bills for families and businesses on the island. Our state motto is hope, and I hope other communities can learn from the success and experience we've had in Rhode Island. It took a lot of hard work and coordination to reach this point, and a mixture of federal grants and private investment, and we still have a ways to go. But the bottom line is this. If we make smart investments in renewable energy sources and projects like this one, it will help us generate both clean energy and jobs well into the future. That's why I joined Senator Copper, who is also speaking today, in introducing the Incentivizing Offshore Wind Power Act. Tapping into the power of offshore wind can help address climate change, reduce greenhouse gases, and make energy more affordable. There is a lot of international competition, and the United States should be at the forefront when it comes to renewables. Again, we've got to make smart, sustainable investments, and we've got to continue to innovate and collaborate. That is why gatherings like this are so important. So again, thank you to all the speakers for being here, and I look forward to hearing what comes out of today's session and working together in the future. Thank you. So I think hearing from both Senator Reid and from Senator Carper is, is important in terms of sort of setting the stage for our briefing today and in terms of thinking about the future and the, the whole potential and what can become real with regard to offshore wind. There's, it just feels like there's a whole flurry of things that have been happening with regard to offshore wind, a variety of conferences that are going on. Uh, there was just a summit on offshore wind at the White House. There was a, a, supply, a business supply network meeting that is going on. There is a major conference that we're going to hear about that is happening in, in Baltimore on offshore wind. We're reaching that time where there finally is kind of a, uh, where the timing is becoming right. And when you have words like Senator Reid saying that the motto for Rhode Island is hope and Senator Carper talking about room for all, well then maybe it is just the right time for here too. And so we're now going to turn for uh, remarks to uh, uh, Fatima Ahmed, who is the manager for federal regulatory affairs in offshore wind with the WIA, the American Wind Energy Association. Uh, before coming to AWIA, Fatima has uh, really put uh, a lot of work in with regard to this whole issue and uh, to energy issues through her work at uh, the Department of Interior where she worked with then Secretary Ken Salazar to help in terms of looking at the licensing of public lands for, uh, for renewable energy. And she also had been an attorney with NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration. So each, and before that, she also was in private law practice. So she brings a wealth of experience specifically that can help in terms of addressing a lot of the barriers and helping see some of the opportunities that we now see. Fatima? So on behalf of the American Wind Energy Association, thank you to EESI for organizing this briefing. We're happy to participate along with some of our member companies and draw attention to the promising technology that is offshore wind. So as the leading trade association for both land-based and offshore wind power, we can say with confidence that it's been a great year for wind power in the U.S. From our perspective, the success of land-based wind in the U.S. is a critical part of efforts to build support for offshore wind. So as context, the U.S. now has an installed capacity of over 67,000 megawatts of land-based wind, 
and there are over 13,000 megawatts currently under construction. Land-based wind supports 73,000 well-paying jobs nationally, including jobs at more than 500 factories in 43 states. So the jobs created, the manufacturing facilities that have been built, and the proof that large amounts of wind can be reliably integrated into the grid all demonstrate to political leaders and members of the public the significant opportunity that offshore wind represents and that it must be a, a vital component of our energy portfolio. So as Jeff will be able to describe in more detail, this summer there was historic progress in the U.S. offshore wind industry with the beginning of offshore construction at Block Island Wind Farm. We're very happy about that. And as Paul will discuss, site surveys have begun offshore Maryland for the proposed U.S. wind project, and we're encouraged about that as well. This year, we also saw the entrance into the U.S. market of a major European player in the global offshore wind sector, the Danish oil and natural gas company. They have taken over the lease for a wind energy area offshore Massachusetts from Res America. So in light of these developments, the American Wind Energy Association is optimistic about the industry as a whole. Offshore wind projects have been proposed in both state and federal waters off of the Atlantic and Pacific coast, as well as in the Great Lakes. The big picture is that offshore wind energy must be a part of our energy portfolio. This spring, DOE released the landmark Wind Vision Report, which describes a scenario in which wind power provides 10% of the country's electricity in 2020, 20% 20 in 2030, and 35% in 2050. To support this scenario, the Wind Vision Report anticipates 22 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, and 86 gigawatts by 2050. Additionally, as we know, last month the EPA released the Clean Power Plan, which will reduce carbon emissions nationwide by 32% from 2005 levels by 2030, with state-specific targets varying in stringency. The final emission guidelines specifically cite offshore wind as one of the tools states can use to meet their targets. So we think that the future remains bright for offshore wind. And at the American Wind Energy Association, we're working closely with our regional partners to develop state markets for offshore wind. So for example, over the summer, we worked with Alliance for Clean Energy New York to submit comments advocating for offshore wind in conjunction with land-based wind in the New York State large-scale renewables proceeding and the New York City request for information on 100% renewable energy sourcing. So substantively, in addition to focusing on the jobs and the environmental benefits of offshore wind, we are trying to bring attention to offshore wind energy's benefits for consumers, including fuel diversity, especially in New England, where natural gas is constrained on cold winter days and electricity prices spike. Um, offshore wind provides a hedge value against volatile fossil fuel prices. Zero fuel cost wind energy also contributes to reductions in wholesale electricity prices. There's a correlation between peak demand and offshore wind resource strength. So on hot summer afternoons, the sea breeze kicks in when electricity is needed most and is most expensive. Also, congestion cost reduction. Offshore wind can help reduce costs for ratepayers by providing power on congested systems like in the PJM region. Now, in addition to the substance, an important part of making the case for offshore wind is building the coalition of stakeholders who are committed to a U.S. energy future featuring offshore wind. We need to build relationships and share knowledge and expertise, whether it's about technical issues such as foundation installation techniques or various approaches to advocacy at the state and federal levels. And so to that end, the American Wind Energy Association is holding a conference beginning tomorrow in Baltimore, and we really encourage you to attend. Our keynote speakers include Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Director Abby Hopper, as well as the DOE Wind and Water Power Technologies Office Director Jose Zayas. We will have international representatives from all segments of the offshore wind industry, developers, manufacturers, operations and maintenance contractors. If you have any questions about conference registration, I'd be happy to speak with you after this session. And thank you again to EESI for the opportunity to participate and for bringing attention to this important technology. Thank you. So now we're going to hear about the first 
project that actually is in the water uh, in, in uh, the U.S. So we're going to hear from Jeff Grabowski, who is the CEO for Deepwater Wind, uh, which is doing the Block Island Project in Rhode Island. Jeff is the, <clears throat> as I said, he is the CEO there, where he manages the whole portfolio of, of Deepwater's offshore, uh, other offshore wind and transmission projects. And so he's been involved uh, in this particular project uh, since its inception in 2008. Uh, prior to, to that, um, while well, he has spent uh, many years being involved in terms of looking and thinking about the whole role of these technologies and how to help shape their, their structures and the government policies necessary. Uh, he had also served as chief of staff to the governor of the state of Rhode Island, where he was senior advisor to the governor on, as, as we all know in terms of a chief of staff, having to deal with basically just everything. Uh, and he also has practiced law in uh, Rhode Island as well as in New York. Uh, we are delighted to hear firsthand, Jeff, about what's happening with Block Island. Good afternoon. Um, very happy to be here today, uh, in particular because <clears throat> Senator Carper and Senator Reid have both been such champions for offshore wind for a number of years now. and. Uh, we in the industry uh, speak highly of both of them very frequently because they're so critical to our effort to building this industry here in the United States. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Block Island Project in a moment, but I'd like to start with some perspective first. Um, many of us know uh, the basic story of what happened in Europe. This is a graph that shows how many megawatts are in operation in Europe from offshore wind projects. And most people tend to focus on the right-hand side of that chart because it's impressive because the lines are really large and there are 10,000 megawatts in operation and off in, in Europe right now, 3,000 turbines spinning. The oldest project dates back to 1991 and it's still in operation. So this is a big, mature, sophisticated industry in Europe where many billions of dollars are being invested every year building these projects. Um, but I often like to focus on the left side of the slide because what we're going through in the U.S. with really slow-moving development of this industry, where it seems like an excruciating long period of time to get the industry started, is, is not really surprising because the same thing happened in Europe. It took almost a decade. And there really were projects back there to the left of 1994. There are just so few of them that they barely register on that chart. Uh, it took a long time before the industry took off in Europe. And then it exploded. And in calendar 2015, there is going to be about a 40% increase in capacity from offshore wind. There are billions and billions of dollars being invested in Europe right now. Consequently, it's an enormous industry. This is the port of Bremerhaven, which was a sleepy, dying port facility. It used to be a fishing uh, port a number of years ago, and suddenly the offshore wind industry showed up. And now it's a big, booming town. And those vessels that you see and those foundations, uh, those yellow things in the back are foundations for offshore wind turbines, um, have created tens and tens of thousands of jobs in Denmark and in Germany and the UK and in France and in the Netherlands and all across, all across Europe. Meanwhile, today we have nothing spinning in the US today, but we have an enormous potential. Um, and the DOE says by 2020 we could have many, many jobs uh, in this industry because it's a big, complex, capital-intensive, technology-intensive industry. And in Europe, all of the big players are in this game. This is not a, an industry for small, uh, for small players. Big companies like Siemens are investing billions of dollars in this technology. It's a real competitive industry. Um, it certainly can work here, and, and this is, these two slides, to me, um, demonstrate why offshore wind makes sense in the U.S., even in the near term. Um, th this, this is the market fundamentals of offshore wind in the U.S. On the left side, you see uh, a nighttime satellite image, which is a pretty good proxy for energy demand. And you can see how brightly lit up it is from Boston to Washington. Um, that also coincides with uh, with really high population, population densities, extremely high property values, 
and let's just say a high aversion to big smelly power plants in those neighborhoods. Uh, so it is incredibly difficult to build anything on that coastline. Imagine trying to get a permit and local approval to build a big natural gas-fired plant in, on, in the East Hampton, New York. Really hard to do. And, and that story can be repeated multiple times across up and down this coastline. Southern New York, New England, those are hard places to build new energy sources. And there's really no other energy in the area um, that's native, that's domestic. But if you look at the right side of the map, this is essentially the solution. This is a wind map of the, of the East Coast. And so the darker colors, the, the reddish, the reds and oranges, indicate really strong wind speed. Um, that red and the orange, those are world-class wind speeds. They're every bit as good as the North Sea where all of the projects, or most of the projects in Europe have been built. So we have a world-class energy resource that's just off our coast. And it is really easy to interconnect that wind resource into these coastal communities. Uh, it's quite easy to build a 20-mile transmission line under the water. Uh, we're the only property owners of federal government. Uh, it's a whole lot harder to build a 500-mile transmission line from Canada to downstate New York crossing 15 different municipalities and hundreds of property owners. So we have a huge demand on, on the left. We have a huge resource on the right. That's the market case for offshore wind in the US. This is just a snapshot of one particular market. This is New England. And this is what's happening in New England today. And similar stories could be told in other parts of the country. But right now in New England, uh, there are about 8,500 megawatts of power that will retire in the next few years. Coal plants, old oil plants, and now adding on top of that potentially some nuclear power plants that are receiving a whole lot more scrutiny today than they did a couple years ago. That energy is going offline very soon. Most of these power plants in the Northeast were built in the 50s and 60s. And those plants are going to retire and they have to be replaced with something. We're beginning a replacement cycle in power generation in the United States. And it's starting here in New England first. Unfortunately, New England doesn't have any domestic resource. And you see that uh, little gas line from Pennsylvania. Sure, there's a lot of gas in Pennsylvania, but you, but you have to get it to New England somehow, which means building really long pipelines that are very controversial. Or you could bring in hydro from Canada. Again, really long controversial lines that are difficult to permit, difficult to site, very expensive. Uh, but we have a domestic energy source just off the coast of New England, and that's offshore wind. Deepwater uh, is working on two projects in the coast of uh, New England right now. The Block Island project, Block Island Wind Farm, you can see on that map, is right in the center. I'll talk about that in a second. But that really is a demonstration scale project and a prelude to the larger project that we're working on, which is Deepwater One, which is outlined in yellow there. Uh, we secured the lease for that site um, from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management through the first competitive auction that that agency held for that site. Uh, we control now, under a 30-year lease, 256 square miles of ocean, which has the capacity to generate about 1,500 megawatts. Uh, and our plan is to develop that site uh, in increments over time and to sell that power into the three markets you see on the map, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Long Island. But, we're, but we have to start with something, and uh, Block Island is where, we're started, uh, where we've started. This will be the first offshore wind farm in the United States. Um, you can see Block Island on the map on the uh, southeast corner of the island. There are five dots down there in that shaded area. Uh, those, uh, those dots represent the wind farm. Uh, this process really began in 2008 uh, with really strong bipartisan support uh, in Rhode Island state government, where we are now... We now enjoy the support of our third consecutive governor in Rhode Island and the entire delegation in the state. So um, we have really strong local support, which for a project like this is absolutely fundamental, and we wouldn't be in this business if we didn't have that support. Um, the project uh, right now is under construction today. As we speak, it's under construction. Uh, we will build it in two phases in 2015. And we'll, we do the first half of the project, and we'll finish the project in 2016. And so it will be producing its first energy around uh, October of next year.
This is a photo. This was the moment when steel went in the water uh, in the United States. That was the end of July. Uh, that is the first uh, steel foundation uh, being uh, lifted into, onto the seabed. Uh, that is uh, a very large crane barge, the largest crane barge on the East Coast, um, lifting 450 tons of steel in the air. And it's about to lower that extremely slowly into the water. Uh, it's about 90 feet of water there. And now we have installed five of those foundations. Uh, we have the project consists of, of five installations. Uh, and uh, we were very excited for that moment. It creates a lot of jobs. You really can't see the text here, but these are photos of this is these are photos of of actual people in Rhode Island working. None of those are stock images, except for the boat, uh, because we're building the boat. It doesn't exist yet. But we are employing about 300 different people locally. Uh, Rhode Islanders out on the water in the port facilities. We're commissioning a vessel that will be built in Rhode Island. Uh, this industry creates a lot of jobs, and it creates jobs across a spectrum from really high-tech engineering to blue-collar jobs, welders and electricians and laborers. Uh, and tug captains and, and everything in between. So it's a very um, uh, labor-intensive industry. Even for the Block Island project, we're using four different port facilities in Rhode Island to build five turbines. So it requires a lot of infrastructure. And this is sort of the potential of what we could be doing more locally. This is European content that we'll be using for the Block Island project. On the left, it's an installation vessel uh, that's coming from a Norwegian company. Uh, but it's a specialized, it's a purpose-built vessel. And on the right is the turbine that we'll be installing. Uh, it's made by Alstom. It's a six megawatt machine. Uh, it's about 600 feet tall from the sea level to the tip of the blade. It's very large. Um, right now, all of the really high-tech work in offshore wind is being done in Europe. And the first slide that I showed you is the reason why. That's where the projects are. Uh, but as we build projects in the US, more and more of the supply chain will come to the US and we'll have our own vessels and we'll be doing more and more of the manufacturing here in the US, um, which will add on to all those jobs I just talked about that were construction related. So this is an, an industry with enormous potential. Uh, we're happy to be here today, happy to answer any questions about this project and uh, happy to be followed by my colleague, uh, Mr. Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty exciting to see that. And I must say, it's got to be amazing to see the scale of this equipment. Sometime I really want to go see one of these operations. Uh, I'm now delighted to introduce Paul Rich, who is the Director of Project Development for US Wind, uh, which is based in, in Maryland. And prior to joining US Wind, uh, Paul had actually been the Development Officer for Deep Water Wind for a couple years. He brings a lot of experience in the energy industry uh, where he had been uh, development officer of CCH Holdings Group, uh, where he had been involved in terms of looking at underground uh, transmission, another very, very important aspect of dealing with, uh, with offshore wind, and had worked on a variety of other electricity projects. He had also served uh, uh, on the staff of co uh, former Congress or a uh, former Congressman Tom Allen um, of Maine uh, as well. And he too brings uh, a lot of experience coming out of the Navy where he had been a lieutenant commander. And so all of those years also help build a lot of the experience that we are seeing in this whole industry and in its interests. Paul? Uh, thank you, Carol, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's exciting to be able to lift my head up out of my uh, cubicle on my desk and actually see some people who uh, aren't either railing against me or uh, running away. So thanks for all, all, all of you for coming. And Carol, thanks for setting this up. And um, what's interesting in hearing her talk about my background is uh, there's at least one project there that's successful that I worked on. And Jeff's making sure there's another one that I had anything to do with is successful. And, our project can only hope to emulate the success that Deep Water Wind is doing right now up in Rhode Island. So I also want to thank Laura and all her uh, work with Senator Carper and, um, and our interests in uh, uh, offshore wind and uh, working with Senator Collins' office to make sure that um, we take care of those things that you can take care of to help stimulate development and uh, without it. Um, 
this industry would truly uh, still be beached, so to speak. So, um, well, I was impressed to hear Senator Carpenter talk about leadership because that's what it takes to get these things off the ground. And I think Jeff was right in pointing out that the European experience took a decade. Um, and yet, as we are wont to do in the US, it's sort of the wild west of, the de of development. We're not fronting big companies to lead these undertakings. They're starting to come now, as we see with Dong Energy coming over from Europe, one of the leaders in offshore wind. But Deepwater Wind is a startup company. The company I work for, US Wind, is a startup company. And so there are opportunities that we're willing to take uh, a chance on, but it takes a little bit of uh, bravery, a little bit of risk tolerance, and you need some help from congressional and uh, state legislatures to make sure you have the support to try to pull this off. In Maryland, what we're pursuing is the same thing as Jeff is up in Rhode Island. Um, we're looking for a larger project that's about 500 megawatts. Um, and I'm not going to spend much time on this page because I didn't know who might cover it, but between Fatima, Jeff, and Carol, even Senator Carper, I think you know the facts and you can look at it afterwards if you like. But um, I'll just dive into the Maryland project. It's a project that starts about 12 miles off of the coast of Ocean City, and it's in a wind energy area that's about 80,000 acres. It uh, will allow for our 500 megawatt project, and in fact, something we'll I'll touch on at the end of this presentation, I mean, we could have more. 1,500 megawatts of offshore wind power could be generated from this one wind energy area that the Department of Interior's uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management auctioned off last year. Um, but we're going to use 250 megawatts of this 500 to pursue under the Maryland Offshore Renewable Energy Credit Program. Now, this gives us a pathway to the marketplace. What that OREC will allow is for us to have a, uh, an opportunity to marketize the rates of our energy to um, the ratepayers of Maryland to allow this project to move forward. All right. The other 250 megawatts were on our own to figure out how to sell that and um, integrate it into the grid. But pathways to marketplace is a key term to remember in all of this because developers can only take this so far with the support from uh, the congressional legislature. Uh, 125 turbine installations would most likely support a 500 megawatt project. Um, and then we're looking to put about two, two and a half billion dollars into the development of this project. Now some of that is capital, some of that is um, development costs, but a large chunk, and Jeff talked about this, is in the workforce development, the construction and fabrication side of this. And what our project at least holds the potential for is helping to bring that supply chain from Europe over to the U.S. shores, right? So we can finally begin to establish a, an industry, a source of workforce development, um, you know, some centers of excellence that will uh, probably develop much like the Silicon Valley did but this time in, in offshore wind, where we start to pull some of that technology over here and set up bases of operation and intelligence and synergy and capacity. So we're looking for an in-service date of uh, the first quarter in 2020. And in and along that way, we're going to be creating about 3,100 jobs. Now, that's direct, indirect, and induced, right? Those are the forecast models. We know we're going to have to employ almost 700 uh, people directly, um, just for welding, for fabrication, for assembly. Some of the jobs Jeff talked about in terms of marine operations and services, there's a whole host of other businesses that develop from this kind of project that in Maryland would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars of indirect and induced benefits to the economy. So it's big business. Um, this project is... Uh, made fairly substantial progress. We secured the lease last December. The auction was held in August and all that happened and then the lease was secured in December. We started building a development team in March and um, we tried to draw from people who were known in the industry or at least had familiarity with the uh, uh, systems and components of the industry. Um, we've invested close to $20 million thus far. Now that's a huge spike and, and the rest of the development costs will probably taper, 
but um, we had to go out into the wind energy area and perform marine survey operations. We had to conduct environmental studies and analyses of avian migration patterns, marine mammals, and sea turtle activity. And all of this goes into a site assessment plan that we then um, submit to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, who's the coordinating agency for our permitting process. Um, and so that's a significant amount of money up front at risk by one company. So we're asking a lot if we think this is going to be popular up and down the East Coast with folks who don't do this over in Europe, right? Um, we also have uh, applied for and received uh, Q positions for our project with PJM. And I say positions because one is, is uh, purely for the OREC slated um, uh, offtake, and then the other is for our uh, remaining 250 megawatts. So we've begun that process. We've had scoping meetings. And perhaps more importantly, we held uh, just Friday of last week an introduction to folks from the U.S. and around the world who are interested in being involved in this project as major contractors doing steel fabrication. So these are folks that would take flat steel, roll into tubular shapes, forms of steel, and assemble these into those jackets that Jeff's company installed off of Block Island. And these folks would be drawn into the Baltimore area because of the scale of this project. Um, building 125 turbines will uh, you know, interest a company to move here to do that kind of activity, um, especially when the oil and gas industry is a little bit um, uh, slowed down these days. Uh, but we had interest from companies in Germany, Georg, and we had companies in Michigan, Louisiana, and um, Ohio. So we were excited to see that there was a lot of interest in that. And Baltimore has a great waterfront resource that can actually allow these companies to do the scale of this work right on the waterfront. So we're interested in that um, and trying to be a uh, catalyst in creating that activity. Um, in terms of federal support, and we've talked about the ITC, um, there's been a great effort now under BOEM to um, organize lease areas and to hold the auctions and, and identify wind energy areas that are suitable for development, and that's really the key. Um, you know, the permitting consolidation I talked about, and then also infrastructure improvements such as DOT Tiger grants, um, DOE, research and development grants um, that folks are taking advantage of are all very important to lay a baseline for the industry. Um, but some challenges still remain. It's still a very lengthy process to permit these projects. And so when I talk about the $20 million of upfront at-risk development capital that we've put into this project, well, we've still got four more years to go before this project is likely to have um, a project in operation. And so your development cycles are enormous. You have to have a lot of risk tolerance. Um, it's, it's also something to encourage around interagency collaboration. So the way the Coast Guard, the Department of Interior, Department of uh, Energy, Department of Transportation, all of these agencies interact is very important that there's a common message that comes out the other side. I mean, if everyone's working in their own individual area, it's helpful, but when there's collaboration, um, as we learned about up in the New England states around this kind of effort, there's a huge benefit to all of us trying to get a common understanding of where to, where to put our resources. And I'll just touch at the end here <clears throat> my last theme, which is really for the developer's interest. Having a pathway to the marketplace is really what's in need of further attention. And by that, I mean in, in Maryland, we have an OREC process, which gives us a pathway to the marketplace for 250 megawatts. If we can encourage the federal government and the staff of these uh, great congressional leaders to work closely with states, um, I think you'll find that there are common benefits to these activities that can be shared in a region, can be shared across states, and the parochial interests of the states are less um, highlighted. Um, we need to continue to assist developers in and organized labor and any number of other uh, folks that are interested in helping to develop a workforce to put funds, put training, and allow us to access capital to develop that. Um, 
Minority business enterprises and small businesses continue to need capital and access to capital, and that's a huge deal. Um, we are trying to encourage uh, a minimum goal of 15% MBE participation in our project in the state of Maryland, which for a technology and an industry that's based in Europe, this is a huge challenge, right? But they need access to capital. We need to help encourage them to be known and to learn and get on a steep uh, curve. Um, and I guess lastly, we need to try to shorten that supply chain. And by that, we mean home-growing companies that can do the same things that are now prevalent in a mature industry in Europe. So to the extent we can uh, you know, follow in your wake in this, in this way, we'd love to. And we're open to participate. Um, I know Jeff's been out on the trail a lot talking about the opportunities in this industry. And at night, he's working on developing the project. So we've got to find ways to really harness all of our activities and the things you are all thinking about to try to make this a, uh, a successful endeavor in the States. I look forward to answering any questions later, but thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Obviously, it is really clear in terms of what a big deal it is and how much risk is involved, along with a lot of opportunity where you can just see it there, but it's a lot of work um, to train with this here in this country. So now we're going to take a look at where this industry really has been growing and been thriving. It took a while, but boy, it's been going gangbusters now as it's really developed. And so we are going to hear first from Dr. George Mao, who is the first Secretary for Energy and Climate with the Embassy of Germany. And prior to joining the embassy, uh, Dr. Mao worked uh, at the German Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety, where he had received responsibility for climate and energy policy, as well as dealing with a number of other environmental issues at the German Environmental Protection Agency. So he has been involved with the Ministry's development of energy policies, uh, which have been very, very important in terms of uh, moving Germany's energy policy, which have then resulted, I think as everybody knows, in a uh, tremendously uh, uh, robust uh, uh, land-based wind and, and solar industry, and over the past few years, offshore wind. And so we look forward to hearing from you, Georg. Thank you, Robin. It's a pleasure for me to, to say a few words on the uh, German experience so far. Um, actually, when talking about offshore in Germany, I think it, it's a part of our whole policy. It is embedded in a, in a larger strategy. That's why I would like to uh, say a few words on uh, what is Germany doing. Actually, uh, a few years ago, the government decided on a long-term strategy um, building on existing measures and new measures. And the, the reason for that was uh, that in a long way and in, in a long term, our energy production is not sustainable. Um, looking at the environmental impacts, looking at the energy security, we are importing 70% of our energy in Germany, and also looking at the cost. That wise, uh, the, the so-called energy Energy event, the energy transition, I think this, this term is now well known already, builds on two major uh, cornerstones in Germany. One is energy efficiency, trying to bring down the demand, and of course, renewable energy. And the, actually, the uh, idea is to build the whole energy system on renewable energies. And of course, you need a lot of transformation, including the market system, uh, the energy research has to provide new um, success, and so on. Um, our four working fields are not only electricity, today we are only talking about electricity, but of course it also includes transport, heating, uh, and all the relevant sectors. So this is the whole concept of our energy, and that is why we have so much uh, push on all the important and relevant energy resources, including wind. Um, if you look at our long-term targets, um, three uh, blocks have long-term targets, climate, we want to bring down our um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, by 80 to 95% at the least. At the same time, we want to uh, increase our 
renewable energy in the power sector are to at least 80 percent and 60 percent overall and energy efficient energy efficiency we want to double the energy efficiency of today so these are quite ambitious targets this is where we stand at the moment so we have a long way to go and when we of course um, which, what is important for a policy like that you have to control it and uh, monitor the success so we are quite quite doing quite well but a lot of projects are uh, as you can see, not, uh, not finalized for the, for the green arrow. Um, we still have a lot of things to do for the next years. So the, the reason uh, why Germany is doing it is, is now quite clear. And the good thing is it's well accepted and supported in the German public uh, with regard to renewable energy. So people prefer to have, even if there's a lot of opposition against uh, new power lines and even uh, um, um, windmills, they prefer to have that one instead of a nuclear power plant in front of their house. Um, this is where Germany stands today with regards to, to our uh, electricity production. We basically came from nothing and renewable energy in 2004. We tripled that amount. Uh, first half year in Germany, renewable energy is 32%, so it's growing fast. And of course, wind is the strongest uh, renewable resource. and uh, offshore is coming. Um, today we have uh, around 40 gigawatt installed capacity onshore and uh, 2.3 gigawatt installed offshore. So offshore is only a small fraction of that but growing fast. This is our uh, target for the next 10 years. We want to expand the today's share of renewables up to 45 percent. So coming now to, to the wind capacity after hydropower, wind is the leading um, resource. So all our studies we looked at when we when we looked at is, is it possible to to run Germany uh, power wise with renewables? It is possible, and offshore wind is an important part of that. Uh, we have the resources actually in the north, and if you if you look at the um, the market, the wind market in Germany uh, grew steadily of, over the last ten years while you see a lot of uh, fluctuation uh, amongst the European states. And the specific situation in Germany is like uh, you have all the capacities, uh, all the resources, the potential in the north uh, of offshore, and you have the consumption centers more in the south and, and the west. So uh, it's also a question of how to bring that electricity to the south. Here you can see the offshore wind potential, and as uh, what was mentioned before that uh, mostly in the North Sea, but also in the Baltic Sea, we have our projects going. Um, this year was exceptionally uh, successful in Germany. So in the first half of 2015, 1,700 megawatt were installed. That is more than uh, whatever was installed in whole Europe in a, within a year. And by the end of the year, we expect uh, altogether a capacity online of 3,300 megawatt in Germany offshore. So that is growing. The target actually in Germany is to have 6,500 uh, 6, megawatt by the end of 2020. Uh, we are on track about that. And the major policy which drives um, the installation of offshore is a feed-in tariff. And we have the feed-in tariff since uh, two decades working in Germany, but to really boost offshore, we had to work on the, 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 um, the system. And the idea is now, and this is what, what actually um, boosted the, the uh, investment in offshore wind, is that we have a concentrated eight-year phase uh, where we give to investors um, a feed-in tariff of almost 19 cents, 19.4 uh, cents for the first eight years and then that feed-in tariff goes back to 3.9 cents. Um, this has actually helped to, to bring investors on board. And of course, it, it also helped in Germany uh, to develop um, new technologies and to overcome the first problems, particularly with the grid, grid connection and with the capacity of the ships. And one uh, example, which uh, Jeff already mentioned, is a sea Port City Bremerhaven, it's a region which experienced a uh, harsh uh, economic downward uh, trend in the 90s and in the 80s. 
and offshore wind actually brought a new perspective to that region uh, with a lot of new, as you can see here, uh, a new enterprises um, being developed on that area. You see it before, before it happened and here with a lot of new uh, companies working. So these are the typical production photos you can see. And this is a projection, uh, it's a little bit out outdated data. Um, actually, at the moment, another port, Cookshaven, I think is uh, taken over the pole position. Um, that, is, that is a positive uh, perspective we have on offshore at the moment in Germany, and we're looking forward to a quite uh, uh, bright future. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that was a whirlwind tour through um, a lot of offshore wind. Uh, we're now going to turn to uh, take a look at what's been going on with regard to the UK and offshore wind, because there, that is another country that has done enormous work. And obviously, I think that you know that there are a number of countries that have in Europe that have been doing a lot. The UK has been a leader, and to talk a little bit about that is Tom Simchak, who is a policy advisor for energy um, for the UK Embassy. And Tom has been with the Embassy, uh, he joined the Embassy last year, and uh, before that he worked with a number of different uh, energy uh, NGOs here in Washington. Oh. Thank you, uh, and, and sorry to disappoint that I don't come with a proper Downton Abbey accent for you. Uh, so offshore wind has uh, long been a central part of the, uh, the UK government's goals for reducing carbon emissions from the power sector and the economy as a whole, uh, and improving security of supply. Uh, unlike the United States, uh, we don't have vast new fields of gas coming online, um, and that's contributing to a great amount of the sort of new power developments in the US, um, and certainly security of where the country's uh, electricity will be coming from in future years um, remains very important geopolitically. Um, so to that end, the UK has been uh, seeking to provide market certainty uh, to renewable energy projects, particularly offshore wind, uh, and reducing the risk of investment um, to leverage private investment. Um, so the um, UK has become the world leader in offshore wind um, and um, is one thing in particular to note is the role of supply chain. Um, you, know, you might not, uh, you know, for the big names, you might see painted, uh, with their logos painted on the side of turbines, but uh, as mentioned a little bit earlier, there's a great deal more to the offshore wind industry. Um, you have port facilities, suppliers, financers, um, you know, everything that goes into all, previous speakers have shown a number of great pictures of those big facilities creating all this equipment, uh, and the UK is becoming a leader in particular in that area. Um, I've mentioned providing marketing confidence, um, building a competitive supply chain, uh, innovation, both in the technology and in uh, financing and making sure that making these projects able to happen, um, and developing a highly skilled workforce. Uh, many of you will be aware that the uh, North Sea uh, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s was a major area of the world for the oil and gas industry. Uh, the offshore wind industry um, really builds on that experience quite well. And that uh, as fewer and fewer new oil and gas fields are being developed, uh, a lot of the in onshore infrastructure, so the port facilities, uh, the expertise. Um, so we saw photos, for example, uh, for the Block, Block Island project of um, those jackets being loaded into the ocean. I believe those were actually manufactured in Louisiana using oil and gas uh, know-how and knowledge. Likewise, uh, in the UK, that knowledge base has been very important um, for the wind industry. And the wind industry has been very important for those parts of the country where we were seeing uh, declines in employment due to the decline of the oil and gas sector. Uh, just some quick facts and figures there for you to take a look at. Um, more than five gigawatts of capacity, um, 3.5 million homes worth of energy production, uh, nearly 7,000 full-time jobs, um, so, uh, and increasingly uh, more and more going in 
as the number of leasing rounds of at least large tracts of, of, of uh, North Sea and Irish Sea waters, um, which we'll see further development in the coming years. And we've got a graph coming up with that. Uh, just very briefly, um, your standard electricity mix graph there, um, looking at the increasing role for renewables, which is mainly offshore wind uh, and existing hydro. Uh, but in the future, that will be offshore wind being the, the, where the UK renewables growth will be. Uh, and again, commutative capacity by year coming in. Uh, this is a little bit dated, but you can see the leading role that the UK has uh, in offshore wind uh, and increasing. Uh, and a map, just to give you a sense, um, the oil and gas industry, uh, I guess I do not have a laser here, but um, the North Sea, so to the east of Great Britain, um, those port facilities are very important for the offshore wind industry. Uh, and also in the Irish Sea, uh, just to the west between um, England uh, and Ireland there. Um, so to meet the target goal of 10 gigawatts by 2020, uh, this shows kind of the, the current process towards getting there. A little bit dated also here, this is from several months ago, uh, and the sector is changing quickly enough that May 2015 is out of date. Um, but you can see operational uh, with significant under construction uh, capacity coming in. Um, I'll discuss the government support on offer section in just a moment, um, but also quite a lot of capacity that's received planning consent for the projects to go forward and quite a lot in planning also. So uh, the 10 gigawatts by 2020 is effectively a business as usual policy case. Uh, without significant further changes to policy uh, or investment environment. So it could be even more. Um, this is kind of a broad sense of what the goals are for the British government in terms of uh, power sector policy. So the three main pillars for power sector planning, decarbonization, security of supply, and affordability. Uh, I think some of you have printouts, so I won't bore you with going through some of the text there, but we'll, worth a look at some of the policies the British government is pursuing uh, to meet these three goals for the electricity sector, or energy sector, sector broadly, I should say, in many cases. Um, so financial support for low carbon energy. Uh, in the past years, uh, our what's called renewables obligation has been the main policy driver for renewable energy. That's basically a renewable portfolio standard. So those of you familiar with US renewables policy will broadly familiar with that kind of policy. But moving forward, uh, the UK government is transitioning to what we call contracts for difference, uh, which sort of feel, fills the same kind of um, policy niche as a feed-in tariff. Um, so how this works, um, um, you'll have to bear with me here without a laser, but um, so effectively, um, a project receives a set, what's called a strike price. So the government determines, well at this point, the government determines a price um, which if the wholesale uh, electricity price is lower than that strike price, the project receives, receives sort of a, a top up. Um, and if the wholesale price goes above that strike price, the project pays that money back. Uh, the idea is that this provides certainty for the project going forward. So they can go to investors and say, hey, we know we can get 60 pounds a megawatt hour for our project. We know what our return investment will be. We're insulated from sort of the vagaries of the market and that sort of uncertainty which would you know, deter investors or the investors would be seeking a much higher interest rate than they can get with this kind of security. Um, in the future, this, uh, this program is going to be changed slightly so that uh, projects are actually bid for a contract for difference uh, and the projects that sort of bid for the lowest possible price uh, will get those contracts, will get that certainty, uh, and that will guarantee lower prices for consumers while still creating that, uh, that certainty for investors, for projects going forward. Um, because, I mean, it's often un just uncertainty with these new technologies that, you know, investors look at this, they say, you know, I've been doing, you know, gas wells since 1975. Like, I know that. I know what looks like a good project. You guys can come in here and tell me how great your, your offshore wind project is, but I'm not so familiar with that. I don't know what, how the markets play. I don't know what kind of volatility there is, you know, how the supply chain will impact it. Uh, this reduces that uncertainty so that they can get that private sector financing. Um, and seven projects so far have received these contracts. 
uh, and there will be many more in the coming years. Um, and just a couple other examples of ways the, the UK government supports uh, financing uh, and other aspects of the offshore wind industry. Uh, so certain areas are designated enterprise zones. You have similar policies in some states in the US. Um, so this is sort of tax relief uh, and uh, like basically accelerated appreciation for uh, business investment. Um, financing of, of helps the financing support for projects. Uh, the Green Investment Bank uh, invests in various renewable energy technologies. Um, there's one or two states that have similar kinds of programs. Uh, export finance uh, for UK businesses uh, exporting goods and services overseas. Uh, and on the research side, the re offshore renewable energy catapult um, supports innovation in the sector. Um, and much of this, and actually much of what I've been talking about, also applies to the uh, ocean hydrokinetics and tidal sector as well, um, which policy-wise often gets gathered together with offshore wind. It's just probably about 15 years behind in technology, but is starting to move forward. Uh, and there we go. It's terrific, and it's kind of staggering when you think about 15 years since that first offshore wind facility came online in the UK. Um, and I think in terms of looking at what has happened in Europe, it's also so fascinating in terms of looking at the interconnection of policy and technology and leadership, political will, how all of that has um, really been critical in terms of making this all happen. Let's open it up for your questions. We've got uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. And if you could identify yourself, please. I'll start here in the back and then here, here, and then over here. Okay, go ahead. You're um, hi, my name is Camille. I'm from Climateware of e, e Publishing, and my question is for the U.S. representatives. Thank you all for being here, by the way. Um, what specific opportunities do you see with the Clean Power Plan, and are any of you in talks with your states to include offshore wind in their compliance plans? Well, that's a complicated one. Um, because the places where offshore wind is most um, likely to be developed first uh, are in the northeastern states, uh, where you know those states, um, I think, generally are acknowledged as having a pretty good head start on the clean power plan right now. Um, I sure wish I could sell offshore wind to um, to the middle of the country. It'd be great if I could sell it uh, into Kentucky or something like that, but uh, it's not the way it works. So. You know, the clean power plan, frankly, is not a major focus for offshore wind right now. I think uh, um, our, our near-term focus is in working with state leaders to, uh, to promote offshore wind. Uh, but I think given the advanced stage of, uh, of where most of the northeastern states are right now with their REGI program, for instance, that is helping a lot of the northeastern states make their initial compliance with the clean power plan, um, it's it's not sort of the, the principal vehicle we're looking at to promote offshore wind. I think perhaps in in the longer term, uh, you know, past the first phase of compliance of the clean power plan, offshore wind certainly can be um, a huge part of compliance uh, with some of the later targets and later goals of the plan. But in terms of the the near term development opportunities, uh, as a project developer, I'm not so focused on the year 2030 right now. Uh, I'm
So you, you can have a great wind resource in a place where you really can't serve the demand for that energy. So the, the value in offshore wind is its location very close to large population centers on the two coasts. So we've been focused mostly on the East Coast here because it's, it's, it's the nearer term opportunity for offshore wind is to serve markets really up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, in particular focused in that area between uh, Massachusetts and Washington. Um, those states in, on that eastern seaboard, they don't have any onshore wind, or have, they have very little onshore wind. And it's very difficult to build large amounts of onshore wind in those states or import it from part of the country where there already is wind. Um, in addition, there's, there's a great amount of offshore wind so markets like Southern California, uh, again, where it's really hard to build big power plants in Southern California, uh, that's a great long-term opportunity for our offshore wind. So I think uh, the way to think of it is uh, you can't just build an onshore wind farm wherever you'd like it, wherever you'd like to build it. You have to build it where the wind is, and you have to build it where, preferably, where there's a little demand. And there's a real mismatch between where the onshore wind resource is and these Janet Larson, Earth Policy Institute and Duke University. I was curious, um, it was great to hear the international perspective, um, and I wanted to know if anyone could comment a little bit about the early U.S. history attempting to get into offshore wind, namely Cape Wind. Um, are they they're completely dead in the water since they lost their PPA? And is there, are other developers eyeing that area to come in, or will anything
means that the projects will be much less visible from uh, where people live. So we're talking about projects that are based in federal waters, far offshore. The wind happens to be a whole lot better mm -hmm. when it's farther offshore. That's the other great benefit of being further offshore. But they're much less visible. Uh, consequently, they they um, are less, much less controversial from from a local community's perspective. And I think deep water wind was was formed to get into deep water where you can't see these projects. Uh, and that's part of what we want to do as a company. And I think most developers who are focusing in the U.S. right now are thinking about these projects that are very far offshore, that that are not nearly as close to the coast as Cape Wind project was. And that's a big change. David Schwartzman. I'm a retired professor from Howard University. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, I'd be teaching. But uh, I have a website with my oldest son, who's an environmental scientist, called solarutopia.org. And we do modeling of global wind and solar and climatic impacts of that. So my, my question centers on the energy return over energy invested offshore wind. If you look at the blogs and uh, uh, websites and so on of the nuclear fossil fuel industry, they claim that the ratio is very low and it's not worth doing. And they, pl they fudge the data by including embedded energy for the renewables, but not for the fossil fuel and nuclear. Uh, so what my question is, what is the state of the science energy return over the energy invested ratio now for offshore wind? And the, the second short question is, what about floating offshore? How, how soon is that going to come? Floating uh, offshore wind turbine.
premise without answering your question, because I think your premise is wrong. Um, so I, I think it's uh, energy prices, again, are a very market-specific question. Uh, and there certainly are markets in the U.S. right now that are very cheap. Uh, because there's a lot of old coal plants that were built in the 50s and 60s that are still chugging along and power prices are very cheap. There are other markets, however, in the U.S. where power prices are not nearly as low uh, as the average or in places like Kentucky or Ohio. Uh, and the Northeast is one of those areas. In the New England region, uh, New York, and even into New Jersey, we're building a new gas plant that is a new build is just about the same price as building a new offshore wind farm in Europe today. So the price of what they're building of, of the latest offshore wind farm today is just about the same price as what it would cost to build a new natural gas plant in Northern Italy today. So we're not very far. We've got to move that supply chain from Europe to the U.S. We've got to build the first few projects in the U.S., which won't be nearly as, as efficient as the projects that, uh, that are being built in Europe today. But the state of the technology in Europe today, with bigger machines, bigger rotors, more efficient, more efficient machines, uh, very, lots of lessons learned on how to install and maintain these projects um, shows that these projects can be built at a cost that's very, very competitive with building other new sources of generation. Remember, when you build a new power plant, whatever it is, it's more expensive than what you're paying today. So your, your power bill, your electricity bill today includes power plants that were built in the 50s. That's why that energy is cheap. If you build a new power plant, your, your electricity bill is going to ratepayers have to absorb that new capital cost that they didn't have previously. So it's always important when we're comparing, and I think it's really important for policymakers to understand this, that when you're comparing energy sources, you have to compare building something new to the cost of building something new. Not the cost of building an offshore wind farm versus the average cost on your power bill today. Because you have to, you have to compare apples to apples. So new offshore wind farm versus solar versus gas plant versus a nuclear plant, they all have a capital cost. And you've always got to compare building something new to building something new. And when you make that comparison, offshore wind really is one of the strongest options in many markets in the US. I will answer the second question, which is the technology piece. And I think it's, it's you know, most of what we're talking about is in the machine term. And the turbines are getting larger and larger. When we started looking at the Block Island project just in 2008, 2009, we thought that we'd be using a 3.6 megawatt turbine. We're now using a six megawatt turbine. Uh, and, and that, there's been tremendous technological advancement in the size and efficiency of the turbines. We're now thinking about the development of our next project, which is a few years away in, from construction. And we're thinking about where will the technology be? What size machine will we, will we be using? We're using a six megawatt machine for Block Island. We certainly won't be using a six megawatt machine for the next project. Is it a seven, an eight, a 10 megawatt machine? Something that's 700 feet tall, um, that, that has not a 50% capacity factor, but 55 or a 60? Who knows? Where that's, that's the principal place of real step change in the cost, is really on the turbine. There are a number of other things in the supply 